The internet has changed a lot of... Uh, the way we do a lot of things have changed thanks to the internet, uh, astronomy included. Um, it's brought on a lot of new ways of doing things, uh, new things that couldn't be done before, and just a couple of minor enhancements. The most obvious is it's just made it much easier to communicate. Um, we can email, obviously. Where's that point to I don't think I'll need it. But, uh, um, just direct communication, email, instant messaging, or even uh, video or teleconferencing with Skype. But more subtly than that, um, previously, if you needed to find someone to collaborate with, you needed to, you needed to know them in advance. You would need to attend a conference and meet them. You would need to see their name in a paper. Um, if you hadn't met somebody through these methods, there was no way to know they even existed. Through social media, uh, for example, or Facebook, or there's a number of others, uh, including online forums, and people have mentioned those before, you get to meet a lot of people that you could not meet. So this is all fairly obvious stuff that this applies to everything, not just as time. And obviously you can then apply your more direct contact. Uh, tools like Twitter also are a great way to uh, announce yourself, which would be known. But this is not particularly surprising, I don't think, to anyone yet. What is much more interesting, I think, is the ability to uh, operate telescopes remotely. There's a number of services that tend to all have their own unique ways of operating. SLU, for example, spelled S-L-O-O-H, um, is a subscription service where you get to directly control a, a fairly large telescope. You book your slots, you get access, you get a nice little web interface, you can aim the telescope left and right and change parameters, and then you get like a webcam feed coming back to you. They also allow uh, guest viewers to, to to watch your session. So you use, uh, use that a lot for major events um, near it near with asteroids passing nearby and so forth. I'm a fan of this one. Uh, it's run by the um, by Bradford University. It's the Bradford Robotic Telescope. It operates very simply. Uh, these parameters listed at the top here. You select these with a system of, of menus and uh, drop downs and so forth. You will decide what kind of object you're looking for. In this case, a block of messy objects, number 42, and you're gonna, which then use the title. You set various options. Uh, what camera would you like to use? Uh, the most commonly used is the Galaxy Cam, which is a, a standard CCD sensor on a 14-inch uh, There's other options as well. There's the Cluster Cam, which is a much wider field of view, and the Constellation Cam, which is a very wide field. It's similar to a DSLR would do. Um, you then set your exposure time. You can select any filters you would like, and your request then goes into a queue. The telescope itself, incidentally, is uh, in, um, on the mountainside near Tenerife. Uh, they have uh, weather sensors and uh, as well as software to determine if your object is above the horizon. And once a uh, slot opens up, a camera moves to position, takes an image, saves it, and mails you. In this case, the parameters are set. Other people have already taken similar shots, and it shows you some examples there. Um, it's quite handy. You can just grab a, a pre-processed uh, JPEG of the image, or there is a Java-based editor which will allow you to do some very, very basic manipulation, mainly just uh, adjusting your levels in each of the three, or the various band. Um, if you went for an RGB image like I've seen it here, then you'll get your three channels if it's monochrome as we want. Um, and there are a number of services like this. Before this time, if you wanted access on a large telescope, you would have to actually either go out and buy it, um, or have some sort of affiliation with an organization that could uh, organize time for you, university or what have you. This again is something that's not so, not, not too new. I've selected two of the most popular, I think, space and um, astronomy sites. Uh, that's nasa.gov and universe today. There's another one that's quite popular, I think. Uh, you might not, you've probably all heard of that one. <laughs> um, these are simple news sites, really. They, uh, they, they, they will have various uh, syndication feeds attached so that you don't necessarily need to visit the websites, although most commonly you would go to get the full picture of the full imaging. 
Some are advertising with private sites like uh, like mine and others. They are advertising supported, whereas NASA is obviously a it's a government department. They are not. This is a side issue. Any image on NASA that probably is free for use, since it is created with public funds. So copyright is not enforced on anything from that website. Just to be interested. But what I found particularly interesting is uh, this service here. Um, Interesting announcements or discoveries uh, used to be distributed by Telegram, and the service is now available in the modern age via the internet. It's simply called the Astronomer's Telegram. You can see the format. They are not concerned with uh, pretty layouts or being attractive. It is simply a purely information source. Uh, the examples here are those happened within, I believe, two days of each other. Uh, they also have a uh, mailing list, RSS feed, so again, you don't need to physically visit the web page. But the point of this is that discoveries get announced and you get them immediately. There's no payments, there's no special affiliations, you don't need to know anybody, you don't need to work for the correct department. You just sign up and anybody, everyone in the world who's connected now knows that, for example, somebody who's worked out that Supernova in 2009 shows broad spectral features again. If you follow this field and it means something to you, if it doesn't, you skip on to the next one. This is probably closest to what I was supposed to be speaking about. Um, I selected these two examples, SK and Hubble sites, since I think they, they do probably the best job. Hubble had particularly good uh, public relations since everybody knew about it. It was a very big deal when it was launched. It was a very big disaster when the optics were faulty and when they came right. Again, everybody, it's, it's a household name. You mention the Hubble, nobody doesn't know what it is. They might be unclear on the details. Maybe they imagine that NASA have astronauts sitting at an eyepiece up there with a camera, but the point is they know that it's there and they've all seen the incredible images. And Hubble site is a large part of that. Um, not just because it allows you to directly access the imagery and the news, but because of the press releases, the, the, the media contacts, and so forth. SK Africa uh, seems to have followed a very similar approach. As you can see, it's not just technical news. It's not, it's, it's not all stuff that's of interest to us directly, but to the general public, to the media. There's technical news, there's job vacancies, there's press releases. There's a picture of President Zuma smiling, well, not smiling, but putting some in the air and, and making some of the dishes. It's good public relations, and as a result, everybody in South Africa knows about the SK, and for the most part, I think it supports it. There's always people who have, um, well, I can't be spending the money on food or something, but something like I don't need to uh, argue that point here. Uh, I'll dwell on this a little bit longer because I think this is an area where South African projects as a whole could really, could even see a bit of improvement. Um, as we know, South Africa has got a very long and illustrious history of astronomy. Um, we would have seen those who were at the planetarium yesterday saw work of Lacaille and, and, and Herschel and so forth. And this is not common knowledge. It's not common knowledge even in this country, let alone overseas. Um, if you read foreign media on the, um, as the announcement for the, the, the science of SKA was, was approaching, there was, some very, there was a lot of very negative talk. Uh, people were saying things like um, they're going to give it to South Africa because they need development. They're going to throw away our science money to build up this country, which is silly because we've got the skills, we've got the history. There may have been a development aspect, but that's not necessarily a bad thing, but that's not the point. It was a level of ignorance about us because the world does not know what we've got. And outside of this room, we don't know what we've got. So that's something that should be enhanced and should be worked on. We should be using the net uh, to, to announce and just tell people. It's not that we don't do outreach, but there's a difference between one-on-one -on -one communication, whether it's at a, at a star party or in a school, and broad media-based. You don't need to spend millions on a marketing campaign on TV and billboards and posters. You have the internet, and if you optimize it correctly, send the links out. You can do a lot. Now for something completely different. Uh, this is a very new thing that did not happen until 
not many years ago. This sort of work, I think, probably started with the search for extraterrestrial intelligence, the SETI at Home projects. They had vast amounts of data to crunch and no budget to buy supercomputer time. So they wrote a software package which can be, which is free to download. Anybody wants to be involved, you install it on your PC. And it would then, whenever the system was idle, connect to their archive and just grab a small chunk of the data, process it, and return the results. With a few hundred thousand people having this program installed, massive amounts of data could, get, could be processed very, very quickly. The idea now with these projects, which have been collected under the Zooniverse label, starts with Galaxy Zoo, is that there are certain jobs that do not, are, are, are very, very difficult uh, for a computer to handle, but are incredibly easy for the human uh, eye and brain. I mean, a, a standard example is facial recognition. Um, a computer that can recognize faces reliably, 100%, is, doesn't exist. 10% error rates, that's more reasonable. Um, and that's just an example of sort of pattern matching that we can do very easily. So the analysis you started with, um, with a team who had millions of images of very deep sky, very um, deep field images of, of galaxies that needed classifying. The software was able to identify this is probably a galaxy because of that level it's either a star or it's a galaxy, um, but it could not classify, it could not sort it out. That is actually a pretty difficult example, even for a human being, a computer has no chance. So the work would generally have been farmed out to students. Uh, here you go guys, here are some images, spend your week just classifying, but with the sheer number of them, that would have taken centuries. So this system was developed using the same idea, get, the, get, get volunteers and open up to the internet, you get an account, you get a five minute training course, and from that point on it just flashes images one after the other. This image comes up and you get asked a series of questions. Is this galaxy nice and smooth and round? Has it got features or a disk shape? Or is it an image artifact or a star? And a few very simple questions like that, the classification gets closed up, you submit it. And then just to, for safety's sake, because you are dealing with uh, general public and not trained astronomers, the same image will be shown to a number of different people and the results will be averaged out. And the results have been very good. They've uh, managed to publish, uh, I was going to say several papers, one that I know of. Um, and the work has been very good. And as a result, they've now launched several other programs. My personal one that I play with is uh, Moon Zoo. Uh, the problem they were solving there was that much of uh, what planetary geologists know about the structure of the solar system and the ages of various bodies is based on crater counts. There's an assumed number of craters uh, impacts that will happen at a certain rate. The point they were, what they were trying to check is, are these assumptions valid? Do they even have realistic crater counts? And so the process was very simple. Use data coming back from the lunar reconnaissance orbiter count the craters and test the assumptions. But again, it turned out to be very difficult for computers to do because the craters come in quite a wide variety. They're all round, but sometimes there's an overlapping crater. Sometimes the sun is at a different angle and the illumination is very different. Very easy for human beings to spot, very hard for a computer. They're expecting a crater count in the billions since they go down to, I believe, I forget the resolution, but it's, it's less than a meter. So very small craters are showing up in these images. Um, I forget what the, what the actual minimum size you can measure here is. But again, the same process. This is work that was simply impossible a few years ago. Um, I think this particular project was launched about two or three years ago, I think. But yeah, it's incredibly easy. It takes, there's a five minute little, little exercise where they step you through, identify it, how to label it, plus any other interesting features that you might see. A couple of images include some of the Apollo landers, for example. If you see that, great, highlight it, and it gets uh, aggregated and, and, and stored. In that particular case, the number of data is so much that even for volunteers on Earth, it would take an impossibly long time. But they are using this data to train the their, 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 their computer to identify the craters. Another example. And there's a number of others. There's Planet Hunters, which is searching for um, Kuiper Belt objects. Um, I believe they said got one to search for exoplanets, studying the sun, and, and so forth. Uh, 
No, that's not bad. Yeah. <laughs> Um, we do have time for questions, so please feel free. Yeah. Uh, how, how difficult, uh, you've given a difficult example for uh, Galaxy Zoo, mm. but uh, is that sort of like a, a bad case? I mean, are, 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 is it difficult normally to determine whether it's Galaxy or not? Well, your first assumption is that almost everything that they show you is a galaxy. If it's not a galaxy, it's very obviously not. Okay. It'll either be an imaging artifact, an image artifact, uh, something you look right on the sensor, and you'll get like a big green streak, for example, yeah. uh, which has managed to fool their galaxy detection. I'm guessing the algorithm is very simple because at the scale that they're looking, there's very little that's not a galaxy. Um, that particular image was much worse than usual. Uh, in my experience, because I played with it for a fair while, they're generally fairly obvious. They might be a bit strange, uh, they're not all digital spirals or, or, or ellipses. Um, some of them are quite, quite odd and clumpy. And in fact, the results from this have uh, led them to suggest a bunch of new classification schemes. Um, but yeah, they're generally a lot, a lot, a lot easier. That's a particularly deep one. You can see it's incredibly noisy and it's, 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 hard, it's hard to make out the details. Yeah, but it, it, it was an edge case there. <laughs> Okay. Uh, uh, can you make sure that you have maximum exposure for your website for outreach if it's by the internet? The general field that covers this is called search engine optimization. Um, in my opinion, most of it is a bunch of snake oil uh, because the field changes so fast, anybody comes along and says, for $1,000, I will, or $200, or whatever, you, I will make sure your page is number one on Google. There are ways to do this, and they, a, well, Google considers them unethical, and Google changes the algorithms regularly to defeat this sort of thing. So the best thing to do is simply to focus on the user experience, since that is Google's stated goal. And I'm focusing on Google because they still hold, I believe, 90% of the search market, so that's where you should spend your energy. So things like keep the page easy to navigate. And bear in mind that Google tests it with a computer, so make it easy for a computer to navigate. So the links must be obvious and readable. Make sure there are sort of frequent updates. Um, depending on the nature of it, of course, the nature of updates will change. If it's just a Twitter account, it's just waffle. Um, if, it's, if it's a technical, uh, if it's aimed at a technical audience, then keep it to the point, keep it correct, keep it accurate. If it's a general, science popularizing thing, you can be a little more casual, you can use more exclamation marks, that sort of thing. But the main thing is keep it, keep lots of contacts, keep it, um, content, keep it updated, uh, updated regularly, and don't worry so much about the usual tricks, like trying to get links from other websites. That has all changed. Google doesn't look at that anymore because it's too easy to fake. And with time, it will spread and grow. Thank you so much.